everybody, good morning, and welcome to EAG Church Online. My name is John, I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and it is so good to have you joining us this morning. If you've just arrived, why not leave us a comment telling us who you're watching with and where you're watching from? Or if you've got something more personal and serious that you would like to share with us, you can put that in the comments as well, or you can message us privately, either through social media or our website, EAGRN.org. Just drop us a line and we'll connect with you right away. Now it's just about time for Sunday morning to get started. So if you haven't already, right now is the perfect time to get a Bible, get a coffee, and let's get ready for another great morning of worshiping God and hearing from His Word at Online Church. together out of the depths I cry out of the depths I cry to you in darkest places I will call incline your ear to me anew and hear my cry for mercy Lord.
God bless you as you give. And if you have your Bibles today, I, I know that we make it easy on you that we, uh, you know, we put the scripture on the screen. But it's also good, you know, to have your Bible, if you will, or, or for some of you, it's on your phone or whatever. Because uh, I, I like to mark up. I used to think as a kid that it was just a sin to write in your Bible. No one ever taught me different. But now I've got all kinds of Bibles, all kind of marked up with, with different things. Because, you know, as the Lord speaks to you, you just kind of, I want to remember it. I want to write a little note or underline it. So uh, it's okay to do that. But I want to go today to Psalm 14. Uh, we're, we're continuing our series, Summer Through the Psalms. Uh, so far, we've looked at Psalm 1, Psalm 3. Last week, John did Psalm 13. Today, I'm going to do Psalm 14. Now, we're not doing these in any type of order. Uh, we're we're going to do a couple of them to lead us through the end of the summer. But let me begin this morning getting right off with our scripture. I'm going to read all seven, eight verses of Psalm 14 uh, in the NIV. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, their deeds are vile, there is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned away, all have become corrupt, there is no one who does good, not even one. Do all these evildoers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. They never call on the Lord, but there they are, overwhelmed with dread, for God is present in the company of the righteous." You evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your eternal word. Father, I know as we read it, God, we're not just reading history. We're not just reading poetry. We're not just reading, you know, you know, good, healthy sayings. Father, we're reading the divine, living, active, powerful word of God. It, it'll, it'll change our minds. It'll change our hearts, which in turn change our actions and our priorities. And Father, that's what our plan tonight, today is, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to speak life in every one of us, the life and the truth that we need, Lord, to take from this place today and incorporate it into our daily lives for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, since the beginning of time, you know, people have had many questions about life and about death, lately about aliens and about, you know, life on other planets, good, evil, and God himself. And I, but I think there's really two questions that, that rise above all of those that we really need to make sure that we answer. The first question, is there a God? You know, that determines it, whether our life is an appointment or an accident, Right? Now, the world says that, you know, life is, you know, is an, you know, evolutionary accident, if you will. We just happen to, you know, you know, come to be. But you and I know that life is an appointment from God. We are made in his image. Now, if we, if we believe that, then, then the second question is even more important. And that would be this. Has God revealed himself in a way that we can know him? And so I'm preaching to the choir here today, so to speak. And we know that that's true. And But as we look in, in Psalm 14 here, we're confronted with the fact that out of the 41,173 verses in the Bible, one half of one verse is given to what someone might call an atheist. A person who, who disbelieves or lacks belief in the existence of God. Out of the 774,746 words in the Bible, 11 words are given to what someone might call the atheist. This is basically the only dialogue God has with this type of person. And the atheist says about God, there is no God. Then the God says about the atheist, he's a fool. The title of today's message is, as I turn this around so that hopefully you remember this, does God believe in atheists? <laughs> you know, the normal way to preach this message would be, did atheists believe in God? Well, we kind of know they don't. And just so you know, atheism is on the rise in America. You know, and especially among young people, among millennials and Gen Xers, it seems that the younger the generation gets, the more that they seem to disbelieve in God and their lifestyles are different. And, and, and we see that all over the place. Some might be an atheist or an agnostic or something else. And, and so you think, why, why do people say or believe that there is no God? Well, there's several reasons. Some people say, and they, they have a reason to say this, they say there's too much pain and suffering in the world. How can I believe in a God? You know, if there is a God, why does he allow all this pain and suffering? And then the second follow-up to that is, if he is God and he is all-powerful, then he must not maybe can do anything about it. Maybe he's not as powerful as we think he is. Secondly, some people say, I face too many problems and struggles myself. How can I believe in God when my life is just such a mess? Evil is all around me and it just, I just can't seem to get past my struggles and my tragedies. 
A third thing that people say is, well, you know, they, they, they're taught that this is not true. They're taught scientific theory. Uh, that's right, and the Bible's wrong, and all these type of things, so, so that just can't be true. And sometimes it's simply pride and sin, right? People just, you know, to acknowledge God is also to, to acknowledge, uh, let me get a handheld here, to evangelist style today, so watch out. <laughs> So some people out of their pride just think, well, if I believe in God, that means I'm going to have to submit to him. I'm going to have to acknowledge him. My life is going to have to change because I can't be my own God and yet there be a God that I'm supposed to be accountable to. So I want to break this down into four main uh, points today. The first one is the rebellious heart of fools. Everybody say that. The rebellious heart of fools. Verse 1, beginning says, the fool says, there is no God. Now, depending on what version of the Bible you might have, the words there is might be italicized in there, and that means that they're not in the original text, but, but the authors put it in there to make it sound better. And so in the Hebrew, it literally says, the fool said in his heart, no God. The fool says in his heart, no God, no, or no God for me, or let there be no God. It's a declaration of defiance. It's a statement of rebellion. Now, now, often this passage would be used, you know, to talk about the foolishness of intellectual atheism, which is people really believe in their minds that there, there can be absolutely nothing, you know, any being, any, any God or anything like that. And, and that's what intellectual atheism is. But that's not the kind of person David has in mind. Follow me here. In David's day, everyone believed in God. Or, or some type of God. That's just the you know, society they lived in. David isn't referring to an intellectual atheist. He's talking about a practical atheist. Now, a practical atheist is someone who believes in God but lives like he doesn't exist. The intellectual atheist believes there is no God. The practical atheist behaves as if there is no God. You follow me? So that's who David's talking to. He says the fool is a person who knows there's an all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present God who exists, yet he lives their life as if it does not matter, or that they will never be accountable to God. David says these people are fools. Now, now they're not denying the existence of God. They're not, they are denying any obedience to him. Now, you might be wondering, why would David, you know, think about referring to a practical atheist in this way? The Hebrew word here for fool is Nabal or Nabal, N-A-B-A-L. Now, those of you that have read the Old Testament will be familiar with this because it's a name of a person that David actually had a confrontation with in 1 Samuel 25. So I want to read you some of that confrontation. And here's the background. David's been anointed king, okay? But yet Saul is still the king, and he doesn't like that. So Saul is on chasing David all around the countryside to try to kill him. But, but David still has been anointed by God to be the next king. And in 1 Samuel 25, David has a small army of men loyal to him. They're traveling around. David needed food and water for his army, for his animals. So he sent some soldiers to a wealthy farmer named Nabal, or fool. So here's what it says. A certain man in Maon, who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name. Then they waited. Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Now, let, let's be real here, and I'm kind of interjecting this a little bit. It wasn't that Nabal didn't know who David was or he came from. Everybody knew that. Everybody knew this was David who killed Goliath. Everybody knew that this was David, the new anointed king. Everybody knew that they were singing in Israel, Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his ten thousands. But, uh, and I'm sure he knew this. He knew he had been anointed king over it. He wasn't denying David's existence. He was denying David's authority. Nabal's basically saying, listen, I'm not loyal to David. I don't have to do anything to David. David doesn't matter to me. He's running around the countryside, you know, running from who is the king. And I'm this rich guy. I don't have to do anything to him. Fool. Nabal had a defiant heart against David. How did it turn out? Well... In 1 Samuel 25, verses 37 and 38, says of Nabal, his heart failed him. He became like a stone. About 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. Isn't it interesting that God struck him physically where he was rebellious spiritually in his heart? You see, Nabal wasn't just being a defiant of David. He was being defiant of God because David represented the authority of God over all of Israel. 
You go back to Psalm 14. David writes, the fool, the Nabal says in his heart, there is no God. See, see, the fool knows God exists, but treats him like he doesn't matter and acts like he's not accountable to him. In Psalm 111, verse 10, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The opposite of that is also true. The lack of fear, the lack of awe, the lack of reverence and respect for the Lord is the beginning of folly, right? And ignorance. See, the most foolish person in the world is not the person who's struggling to believe in God. It's the person who says they believe in God, but they act like they don't have to obey him or follow him. Now, the second thing David points out about fools is not just the rebellious heart, but the ruined life of a fool. The ruined life of a fool. When he says this person, there is no God, the second part of verse 1 says they are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. So God takes a spiritual x-ray of a heart of someone who refuses to trust him, who refuses to live for him. What does he see? They are corrupt internally. Therefore, they do corrupt things and abdominal things externally because of what's in their heart. They are not sinners because they sin. They sin because they're sinners. You've heard the saying, rotten to the core. That's what God is saying about the fool. They have dirty, corrupt hearts. They think dirty, corrupt thoughts. Therefore, they live dirty, corrupt lives and do dirty, corrupt things. Friends, we see and hear about these things all the time. We wonder how. Well, back in Genesis chapter 6 of Noah's day, here's what it says about the people of Noah's day. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of human race had become on the earth, that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. That's what it said of them. Genesis 6, where we're six chapters in, into the Lord's, you know, word. And, and here is the human heart evil all the time. Notice something and don't miss it. God, God deals with this foolishness, not on an intellectual, but on a moral level. You'll never understand atheism or, or, or this foolishness until you realize it's not, not so much a mental problem as it is a moral problem. Amen? So God takes a spiritual x-ray. And, and, and he sees that this person, they deny God. They, they won't deny that he exists, but they, they, don't, they want to be their own God. And I think about it. If there's no God, there's no judgment, right? If there's no judgment, there's no reason to worry about eternal punishment. If there's no judgment and no eternal punishment, you can live any way you want without any repercussions or consequences. How I many know oh, that's just not how life is? Back in, in Psalm 10, there's a verse... Verse 13, that gets to the root of people who deny the reality of God. It says, why has the wicked despised God? Because the wicked says to himself, you will not demand an account. God, you will not command an account. If there is no God, Joseph Stalin can kill 20 million Russians and get away with it. Adolf Hitler can annihilate 6 million Jews and get away with it. It was the Russian philosopher Dostoevsky who once wrote, if God does not exist, then everything is permissible. Friends, how many know that's just not true? Practical atheism is not a head problem, it's a heart problem. It's not that they can't believe, it's that they won't believe. The practical atheist knows God exists. He's just decided he's going to be his own God, do his own thing, and live his own way. Now, the Apostle Paul talked about this in Romans 1. He says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what they may be known about God's plan is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. So Paul talks about this. Anyone here ever been to Mount Rushmore, South Dakota? Okay, look at that. Now, I've not been there yet, hopefully one day. But look at those enormous faces of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt. At any time looking at that, or if you've seen it live, did you ever think to yourself, you know, this could have happened when the conditions were just right for the rain and the weather to erode, you know, all this natural rock formation. And after hundreds of years into the likeness of these four presidents, given enough time, the right circumstances, this could have happened all by itself. Has anybody here, anybody that you know ever had that type of a thought? Of course not. That, that, that would not occur to any normal, rational person. No one would believe that those faces were not designed, created, and built by someone. You might not know who did it, but you know someone did it. Somebody had to do that. Now, it's humorous, 
that God is speaking about someone who doesn't even believe in him. I read about a child who was raised in an atheist family, and one day the little boy sat at the dinner table to his mom and dad and said, do you think God knows we don't believe in him? <laughs> there are PhDs who intellectually understand E equals MC squared, but spiritually can't recite their ABCs. They see a car and believe in a manufacturer. They see a portrait and believe in an artist. They see a book and believe in its author, but they see creation and refuse to believe in a creator. Amen? You know, on vacation this week, one, one of the things I like to do, my wife, I like to get up early, real early, and ride my bike down to the beach so that I can see the sunrise. And I got to see, see one most every day. There was a couple days, it was a little bit cloudy, and so it took a while before you could see it. But every time I was there and looked at it, everyone was different. And every time I had the same thought in my mind, this is the day the Lord has made. He's made it particularly this day, and I'm going to rejoice, and I'm going to be glad in it. And, you know, there's a whole lot of scriptures that talk about, you know, you know, creation declares the glory of God. The Apostle Paul says every star is a neon sign pointing to God. Every sunrise, every horizon are billboards that declare there is a creator in the universe. It doesn't matter if you gaze into the galaxies through a telescope or look at some amoeba through a microscope. You'll, you'll see incontrovertible, incont incredible evidence of a creator. And you may not think that you fall into the category of a foolish person this morning, but, but let me give you a couple of examples of practical atheism. The foolish person is a person who says he believes in God, but never prays to him or talks to him or serves him. The foolish person is a person who says he believes the Bible is the word of God, but never reads it, never studies it, never obeys it. The foolish person is a person who says that hell and heaven are real, but don't really care where people go. They're not on a mission to rescue people on their way to hell that they might go to heaven. The foolish person is a person who says they believe Sunday is the Lord's day, but just can't find the time to find the Lord's house and honor the Sabbath day to make it holy. Probably the one of the most famous atheists was a lady named Madeline Murray O'Hare back, you know, in our day. She changed her life later. But here's what she said in her early days. I am an atheist not because I searched behind every star and looked under every rock to prove there is a God. I'm an atheist because I want to live my life as if there were no God. And that's probably where a lot of people are that, you know, don't want to declare God that they're fool. One more illustration here. Louis, Louis Gigolo is a pastor. And he once spoke about inconceivably big our God is. He spoke how, how the universe and the being, how he breathes stars out of his mouth, how, how there are huge raising ball. He, th then he went on to speak about how the star-breathing, universe-creating God also knitted, knitted our human bodies together with an amazing detail and wonder. And he went on to talk about how we can trust that the God who created all this also has the power to hold it together. And he started talking about laminin. Everybody say that word. It's a fun name to say. Laminin. Wikipedia describes laminins as a family of proteins that are an integral part of the structural scaffolding of, of basement membranes and almost every animal tissue. Laminins are what hold us together, literally. They are cell adhesion molecules. They're what holds one cell of our bodies to the next cell. Without them, we would literally fall apart. This picture is a picture of laminin. This is not a Christian picture of laminin. This is the picture of laminin. Now tell me that our God is not amazing. The glue that literally holds us together, every one of us, is in the shape of a cross. Thousands of years before the world knew anything about laminin, Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, penned these words in Colossians 1, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Hallelujah. From a literal standpoint, we are all held together by the cross. We're held together by the cross. Amen? I've heard it's a statement that it's level ground at the cross. You know, the cross was on a hill, but when all of us humanity stands at the cross, you know, there are no people that stand higher and this and that. We're, we're all saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul says, deep within every human heart, there's knowledge of the eternal power and divine nature of God. In other words, it's not that God has not spoken. People aren't listening. Amen?
It's not that people don't know there's a God. They choose to, you know, push it aside and deny him. What, what's the result of all this? Well, back to Romans 1. Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. So God declares this is the condition of every fool. He's wicked, he's corrupt, he's tainted, he's stained, he's dirty. The evidence is not just who he is, but also in what he does. But yet, God has made himself very well aware. Amen? So here's the third thing. We, we find the disturbing revelation about fools. The Lord looks down from heaven, verses 2 and 3, on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. So when David says the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men, he's not talking about just his time. He's talking about all people for all time. God is all constantly looking down. It's a euphemism, meaning God looks from his eternal perspective over all the earth throughout history, looking for anyone who understands truth and who seeks the Lord. And from those of you who have read and studied the Bible, those verses should sound familiar because it's not just here in the Old Testament. It's in Romans 3. Again, here's Paul. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. So here's a disturbing revelation that Debra claims. And Paul says in Romans 3, every person ever born is either a present or a past fool. Right? They're, they're, you know, because we're all born with sin. Amen? We know that. So, Romans 14, uh, Psalm 14, Romans 3, there, there aren't an indictment of all the wicked people who know there is a God but refuse to seek him, love, and obey him. Uh, the, 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 these are an indictment of all humanity, more specifically of you and me as well. So all of us here, I believe most of us would say that we're, we're past full. We've, we, we've come to the reality of God. So, but everyone starts out as this type of fool. We're born that way. We're born sinful, self-centered. We're all born wanting to be our own God. We're, we're taught this in Psalm 51. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And so that, that's the point here that David is making. He understood from the moment of his conception he was enslaved to sin. Sometimes people say man is basically good. Give him a decent environment, a good education, enough resource to get by and good things will come out of him. Well, it sounds reasonable. Except the only problem is that's the opposite of what the Bible teaches. Okay? We're not naturally good. We're by nature bad, corrupt, sinful. And where, where does the fool say no God? In his heart. In his core. The very center of who he is. Where does God look to evaluate and judge a person? I mentioned this in my introductory remarks after worship today, but 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And, and you see, the opposite of this is also true, friends, that we, we might know and see people in life who just have a hard life. They, they don't live a, a glorious Christian life, if there's any such thing as that. We might look at them and think, man, they're, they're, they're kind of shady people and they're this. But God looks at their heart. God looks at their heart. Amen? Looks at their heart. As a, as a young minister, you know, I had a lot of responsibilities and goals. Bro, I did the youth. I did the kids. Uh, you know, I did street ministry. We had a, a ministry... Uh, to, to people without a home called The Last Resort. We had a farmhouse that somebody donated. We fixed up so guys could stay there. I had to go pick up those guys, bring them to the church, get them working and doing things. And, and, and there's a couple guys that just, just you know, they had, had some alcohol problems. They just couldn't get over it. They, they had other issues. They, they just struggled. It was just tough on them. And they're... You know, we, we did the best we could with them. But, you know, God looks at their heart. Do you understand that? Several years ago, uh, Nancy and I had, had a dear friend. Uh, her name was Lisa. Uh, she was married to a, a judge in Goldsboro. I won't mention the last name, but she, she had how many kids? Nan? They have five kids? Six. Six beautiful kids. And he was an older man. She was younger. Uh, just, just the kids were just lovely. They all loved Nancy because Nancy reminded them of their mother. Uh, but we got the call one day that she had shot herself. Now you think, how, how could this happen? How could she, she had these beautiful kids, a beautiful life. They went to church. And this 
lady just took her life. And you think, how, how can that happen? We went to the service in Goldsboro. My friend Bill Wilson did it. Bill, a uh, pastor friend of mine, uh, he, we brought him here to the church years ago, but he's passed on now. And, and we went to the service, and Bill, Bill's message was, don't make it worse than it already is. That was the title. Bill was great on titles. Because he's the one that told me, if you can come up with a great title, people remember your message. And that was true. You know, he had a message a long time ago that he preached. And he said, he said, I've waited long enough. And he talked about, you know, Sarah, you know, and, uh, you know, they, they didn't wait on God for Isaac to come. And they took things in their own hands and it becomes a mess. When we take things in our own hands because we've waited on God long enough, we create a mess, my friend. Well, we went to this funeral, and, and Brother Bill, this is a hard funeral to preach. How many know? You're, you're preaching of, of all that you know as a good Christian lady, which I believe she was, but she took her life. And he said, he said don't make it worse than it already is. Don't, don't try to throw legalism in here or things, or whatever your belief or unbelief, and think, well, because she took her life, she committed murder, so she went to hell. Some of you are looking at me, well, well what is it, Pastor? You know, well... I read the Bible and I see Samson in, in the Hall of Fame of Faith and also see Samson in the Old Testament telling the Philistines, hey, put me between the two pillars holding this building up. And he said, Lord, give me strength one more time that I give my life and kill as many Philistines as I can. And he did. Jesus said, nobody takes my life. I give it. Now, I'm not trying to to, to put Lisa in the same category as the, these, of, of the Lord especially, I'm just saying that somehow this was a troubled woman that thought that was the only way out. Can I say she's not the only one in the history of the world? Amen? I'm just trying to say that we, we look at things in black and white a lot of times and not everything, you live long enough, you realize everything is not black and white. Everything is not always what we, we were taught. That's why the Lord comes along and he's talking to all these, you know, people in the Sermon on the Mount that, that knew the scripture that they had, that were trying to obey it. But he said, you've heard it said. In other words, the scribes and Pharisees have taught you all this up, but I tell you. In other words, after all those years, they got real legalistic and we know about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, always, you know, getting in Jesus' case. What I'm trying to say, friends, is in our Christian life, we need to extend grace to others and understanding, just like we want them to extend grace to us. Amen? Now, I probably got started on something that I really can't finish with explanation, but I just, I just want to say that the Lord looks at the heart is my point. He looks at the heart. And, and we need to understand that, 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 you know, maybe in heaven one day we're going to be surprised by who's there. We might also be surprised by who's not there. I hope we're not, friends, because I know the Bible says the Lord would that none perish. You know, if I were to ask you today, those of you that have kids, and, you know, which one of your kids are you willing to give up to die? Are you kidding me? Come on now. Now, you might have had a tough kid that, that you know, wrecked you over the coals a little bit as they were growing up, and maybe still are. We, we're not going to give them up. Are we? we? We gotta understand that God the Father looks at all creation like that. He, he, he looks at us, we're in church today, and all the fine folks in, in churches all across the land and across the world when they meet at their certain time. He's also looking at all the terrorists, and he's also looking at all the people of every tribe, every tongue, every nation, gather where they are doing, the, and he, he would that they not perish, that they hear the truth of the gospel. Come on, friends, amen? Because, why? Because we're all made in his image. And you know, if you have trouble understanding that, just realize that, that half the New Testament is written by, you know, you know, the biggest terrorist of the early days, and that was Saul, who became the Apostle Paul. I mean, we have the testament of him chasing down believers, throwing them in jail, holding the coat while they stoned Stephen to death, because he, he approved of all of that. So I'm just saying, God looks at the heart, and we, as Christians, need to have a little bit of his heart in how we see people. And I'm not saying that we, you know, 
want to go along with their sin. No, we don't do that. Or we just make excuses for them because they're being foolish. You know, there, there's other things we need to do. But by implication, Jesus, Jesus is saying without a pure heart, you'll never see God. You'll never know God. You'll never love God. You'll never believe. You'll never live for him. And so none of us start out with a pure heart, but we've got to get to that place where we have it. Theologians often refer to this as a total depravity of man. It does not mean you're as bad as you could be. It doesn't even mean everyone does equal amounts of evil. It just means that we're born that way. And the Bible declares that. that. That's why Jesus had to come. Even at our very best, without God, we're still stained by our sinful nature. So what appears to be a good deed or a nice gesture can still be tainted by sin. So the Bible doesn't say no one seeks peace from God. No one seeks forgiveness. Of course, we all seek all the wonderful things that God wants to give us. And if we think there's a chance that God's going to give them to us, yeah, we're going to ask God. You know, you know what do people cry out in their time of, of difficulty? They're, oh my God. Help me, Jesus. And they might not be any type of a Christian person, but there's something inside of them knows they can call out. And the Bible says here, no, no one seeks for God just for God's sake. No one does good for goodness sake. It's that radical self-centeredness that makes the world a mess. In fact, Jeremiah says in 29 verse 13, you will seek me and find me. You will search for me with all your heart. So if I were to end Psalm 14 right here, man, it's kind of depressing, but it doesn't end there because the last thing is, is there is a divine rescue for fools. And I could add fools like what you and I have been. Verses 4 through 7. Do all these evildoers know nothing? They devour my people as though they're eating bread. They never call on the Lord, but there they are, overwhelmed with dread. For God is present in the company of the righteous. You evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. So David says, the fool's only hope is salvation that comes out of Zion. And if you don't understand Zion is, what Zion is in the Psalms, you'll miss it because Zion is a high hill on which the temple was built. The temple is where God's presence dwelt. It's where the people of God worship. It's where sacrifices were made and sin was forgiven. So in that day, you couldn't just enter into God's presence anytime you wanted to. Had to offer sacrifice first. In essence, God said, I'll meet you over the sacrifice. Without the sacrifice, you have no access to me. Without the sacrifice, I would have to kill you. So they went to the temple and they met God over the sacrifice. And then Jesus comes along and he says, if you tear down this temple, I'll raise it back in three days. The religious people went crazy. You know, they, they testified that against Jesus. But Jesus wasn't talking about this building. No, the temple. He was talking about himself. He was talking about his death and his resurrection because Jesus was the true temple on earth. He was there. He was where the presence of God dwelt. Jesus was a sacrifice for sin. Through him, forgiveness was offered. Jesus was raised to life. And guess what? Now he offers that to you and I. So do you want to see the greatest evidence of the love of God? Go to the cross. Do you want to see the greatest evidence of the justice of God? Go to the cross. Do you want to see where the wrath of God and the mercy of God met by the grace of God? It's the cross. Amen? Now, God says, you can meet me. You can know me. You can worship me. You can enjoy forgiveness if we meet over the sacrifice of my son at the cross. David says, of all the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. He's looking forward to that first coming of the Lord. He's pointing to and prophesying of Jesus who would come and be salvation for Israel. And the same Savior who David said would transform Israel nationally now saves each one of us individually. So when it comes to my sinful nature, here's the reality. Only Jesus can transform it. What can wash away my sin? Come on, say it. You know the song, nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's just not a great song. Romans 3, 23 and 25 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are all justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. So only Jesus can transform my sinful nature. Secondly, the Holy Spirit indwells us so that we continually fight that desire to pull us back into that old life. Romans 8 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. 
So even though every Christian has been forgiven of the penalty of sin, we are still in a battle with the presence of sin all around us, tugging at us to do this and say this and go there. And, and you and I are in this daily battle because our, our, our flesh is still, you know, predisposed towards sin. Being a Christian doesn't mean you no longer sin. It means that now because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, you have power to fight it. Power to fight it. And then lastly, in heaven, we'll all be free from it. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So the question is, are you a current fool today, or are you a past fool? My, my, my hope and my prayer and my, my thought of looking at everybody out here is that we're all past fools. Hallelujah. Amen. We, we, we've got the wisdom of God. We're, we're headed in, in the way that he wants. You know, we, we're trusted in the Lord. We, we are filled with his Holy Spirit. We have power over sin and sickness and death and all of this. And, and, and the truth is we can have a relationship with God. We can know God. We can talk to God. Friends, we can live for God. We can make sure that, that, that we know and others do not know there's, there's nothing foolish about us. Amen. If they want to call us fools, we're God's fool. Amen. We're fool for him, for his sake. Amen. Father, I just thank you for your word this morning in Psalm 14 that David penned and encourages us today. And God, we live in a world, this, this message to me is so relevant because we live in a world where so many people say there's no God. Father, I meet people all the time that they, they go to church, but they don't act like the church. They're not really connected to the body. They're just doing something that they feel they need to do. But Lord, you, you, you want us to be so much more. You know, Peter talked about that we are lively stones. We are jointly fitted together. And we see from Lamb and Lord, it's the cross that holds us together. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that holds all believers together. Father, I pray for those, Lord, that, that may be living a foolish life. Lord, not totally engaged not desiring the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, not, not, not reading the Word and, 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 and living the Word. Th those that are just struggling, God, and we all struggle from time to time, but Lord, we can have victory every single day. We can have hope and joy and peace and strength every single day. Father, I pray for those areas of our life where we do struggle. And Lord, that's reality. That we get victory over that, God. For greater is He that's in us than He that's in this world. We know this. Thank you, Lord that none of us here say there is no God. Our hearts have been redeemed, have been transformed and changed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you that that same power that raised Jesus from the dead raises us from those dead thoughts and those dead way of life into the new life in Christ. We give you glory today in Jesus' precious name. Would you stand as we close with a song? Well, one more time, thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning with us. If you would like to find out more about EAG, who we are and what we do, then make sure to connect with us at these social media links down below. You can also go to our website, eagrm.org. We would love to hear from you and get you connected with our church family. Now that's all the time that we have for this Sunday, but make sure to join us again, same place, same time next Sunday as we come back together for another great weekend of online church. We look forward to having you join us. And so, until we see each other again, stay safe, take care, and God bless. Have an awesome Sunday.